Hallelujah. Grace and peace. Welcome. This is Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm Apostle Marcos, pastor of Transforming Word Ministries. I want to welcome all of you who are joining with us and or watching this video. If this is you and you're joining with us for the very first time, just a brief overview as to how we conduct the Bible study. I urge you to get your Bibles and follow along with me. Get a pad, get a pen, take notes. If along the way the Holy Spirit drops something in your spirit, or if you have any questions, write them down, because at the end of the Bible study, we will have a period of time for questions and answers. Amen. So if you do have a question, or if you just like to say, hey, in the name of Jesus, write it down. At the end, we'll share it with everyone. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Allen. Welcome. Hallelujah. Before we get started, I'd just like to share with everyone a notice. Hallelujah. God has enabled me to finish my uh, newest book, one of my newest books anyway. It's entitled Acts of the Apostles, and it's a fully annotated uh, study of the book of Acts. Amen. This is really only book one. There's just so much of it. I had to break it up into two books. Hallelujah. But I'd just like to share it with everybody. It is available now. You can order it uh, through print or as an ebook if you don't want to wait that long. Amen. And you can order from either lulu.com or from amazon.com. And the link for Amazon is right here in the comment section. Amen. So, amen. If you're uh, looking for a study on the book of Acts. This is book one. So both book one and book two are available on amazon.com. You can just click the link below and you can order your copy today. And I just want to thank you in advance for your support. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. And it was a lot of work. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, before we get started, hallelujah, as always, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we honor you. We love you, Father. Thank you for gathering us together again today, Father, as we journey through your word, Father, as you guide us and carry us through your word, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father, I pray that all our minds will be open just a little bit more and eyes open to see what we may not have ever seen or considered in your word before. Hallelujah. Father, I step out of the way and I pray that no flesh would rise up. I put my hands, Father, myself, under your complete control, Father. We yield the floor to you as we move forward in your word and in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Albert. Hallelujah. Sister Georgia, welcome. Hallelujah. Those of you that have been joining with us know that we are in our series on church cliches. And tonight, um, it's kind of like part three of a little mini series. Amen. Two weeks ago, we uh, focused on apostles. And last week, we focused on prophets. This week, we're going to focus on the foundation. Hallelujah. We understand that the church is built, as according to Ephesians chapter 2, built on the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. But how many understand what that foundation is? Hallelujah. Well, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul explains to the believers uh, there in Ephesus Uh, He talks to them about the interconnected and interdependent relationship that they have with Christ and with fellow believers, and that they have been added to an institution that was much bigger than their individual selves. Hallelujah. And the church has gotten much bigger since that time. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 13. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 13, Paul tells the the Ephesians, but now in Christ Jesus, ye Gentiles, 
who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For Christ is our peace who has broke, who has made both Jew and Gentile one. Hallelujah. And has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And when he says between us, he's not talking about between man and God, but between Jew and non-Jew. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or the hatred, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain or two, one new man so making peace, and that Christ might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God, in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, Gentiles, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh or near. For through Christ, we, Jews and Gentiles, both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye Gentiles are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And look at this, verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, it's this one verse that we're really going to explore a little bit later in this teaching. So let's just hang on there. Verse 21, in whom, Jesus Christ, all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you Gentiles also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, note the capital S, so it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So now we can perceive the spiritual concept. This structure that's being built is God's ecclesia, which means the church. And it's comprised not of brick or wood or concrete, but of believers of Christ. Now, verse 20 tells us that the ecclesia is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This also reveals that a foundation is not the finished structure. Foundation is the Greek word themeleos, themeleos. And here it's used as a metaphor, meaning foundations, beginnings, first principles. And the context refers to a system of truth. The, the foundation and whatever is built upon it are both the entire structure. So therefore, the ecclesia and the foundation it is built upon are both the body of Christ, with Christ as the head. Christ's People are gathered unto him as living stones that would be fitly joined together or aptly, properly supporting each other as well as the entire structure. This was spoken by the Apostle Peter. So let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Raymond. Welcome. 1 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 1. Peter said, wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. And the milk of the word is the basic principles of Christianity, the basic principles of our faith. He says, desire the basic principles that you may grow thereby. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming, as unto a living stone, 
disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the picture here is of converted people being joined together to form a temple of which the system of truth that supports our faith consists of the teachings the apostles received from Jesus and revelation received from the Holy Spirit. This should be ample evidence that the church is the people, not the four-walled buildings that people gather in. The people. All right, amen? Hallelujah. Now, as many people know from having seen any construction site, a natural foundation is an underlying support that a structure is built upon. Now, in order to remain standing, that structure's foundation must be strong and balanced. Therefore, we can conclude that there are stable foundations that are capable of supporting what's built on them, and there are unstable foundations that provide little or no support. Now, in the parable, I'm sure you could probably guess where we're going from here. In the parable of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said that everyone that hears his sayings and doesn't do them will be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Christ uses this as an example of an unstable foundation and the consequences of building on it. Let's turn there, Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 24 through 27. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Albert. Welcome. Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 24. Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And all of this calamity symbolizes strife, commotion, tribulation. And that house fell not. And he tells us why. For it was founded, and this word founded is the Greek word themelio, again, what we heard before, meaning it was made stable, it was established upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house. So this symbolizes the same strife, the same commotion, the same calamity and tribulation. And that house fell, and great or total was the fall or the ruin of it. Hallelujah. So the house here symbolizes one's life, and that includes family and things that are important to us. The rock, however, is not a chunk of rock that we can dig up out of the ground. It symbolizes the foundation of truth that was spoken by Peter. And that was that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God. This truth must be revealed by the Holy Spirit to each of us individually, and it must be believed. Hallelujah. So the onus is on us. Christ will give that revelation, or I should say the Holy Spirit will give that revelation, but it's us up to us to believe it. The same way it's up to us to believe the gospel. Christ and the Father enable us to be able to do it, but the choice is ours. Hallelujah. So therefore, those who receive the revelation from the Holy Spirit of who Christ is will not only 
hear his word, but they will do it as well. Just as there are today, however, there were plenty of people in the Gospels who heard Christ speak but didn't do what he said because they were blind to what he meant by it. And there was a reason for it. Let's turn to John chapter 8. We're going to read verses 43 through 47. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Toy. Welcome. Hallelujah. Here, Jesus confronts the Pharisees. Verse 43, and he asked them, why do you not understand my speech? And he tells us the reason why. Even because you cannot hear my word. Now, word here is the Greek word logos, which we know means thoughts, ideas, and concepts, spiritual in nature. So Jesus is saying that they could naturally hear his spoken words, but they couldn't perceive the meaning behind them. Verse 44, and now Jesus tells them the reason for this. You are of your father, whom Jesus then exposes as the devil, which means accuser. And the lusts of your father, the accuser, will you do. He, the devil, the accuser, was a murderer from the beginning. Now, years ago, I used to think that this was in reference to him influencing Cain to kill Abel. But it actually goes back further than that, further, or, or I should say before mankind was even created. It's talking about, remember, we're talking about an accuser and a slanderer. It's talking about Lucifer slandering God's name and reputation, which we can read about in Acts chapter 28, verse 18. And it's hidden inside of the English word, which is seen in that verse as traffic. Look it up and you'll see what it means. It means slandering, peddling lies. Mm. So, so he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Now look at this. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, and it means that he's speaking of his own thoughts, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, just to make a quick side point, if you notice what Christ is saying here, when the devil speaketh a lie, this implies that the devil doesn't always lie, but there are times when he will tell the truth if it suits his purposes at that time. There's plenty of times when, uh, especially in the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, where the devil did speak the truth. Mm. But what he does is he will add some lie to that truth or take a lie and add some truth to the lie. In either case, he mixes the truth with lies and that is to bring confusion in his victim. Amen? So let's not get it confused. Yes, he's the father of lies and he is a liar, but that doesn't mean he lies all the time. He will tell the truth if it suits his purpose and if it's to his benefit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless your sister Margaret and welcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So. In his epistle, John tells us a little bit more about the devil and what prevents people from perceiving truth in the words of Christ. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 8 through 10, and I'll be reading from the God's Word translation on this one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Tony. Welcome. Hallelujah. 1 John. Chapter 3, we're going to read verses 8 through 10. John said, the person who lives a sinful life belongs to the devil. 
I'll say that again. The person who lives a sinful life belongs to the devil because the devil has been committing sin since the beginning. The reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy what the devil does. What does the devil do? His name means accuser and slanderer. So he came to destroy what the devil does by replacing the devil's lies with the truth of God. Hmm. You enter a pitch black room, you turn on the light, and there's no more darkness. So if you enter into a situation of a lie and reveal the truth, the lie has to leave. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 9. Those who have been born from God don't live sinful lives. What God has said lives in them, and they can't live sinful lives. Now, let's not get it wrong here. It doesn't mean that they don't sin from time to time ignorantly. Amen. What this is talking about is a lifestyle of habitual sin, knowing that it's wrong and doing it anyway. There's a difference. Hallelujah. Paul, uh, John goes on to say they have been born from God. And verse 10, this is the way God's children are distinguished from the devil's children. Everyone who doesn't do what is right or love other believers isn't God's child. Hmm. Now let's skip over to the next chapter, verse uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 6. Again, I'll be reading from the God's Word translation. And he says, we belong to God. The person who knows God listens to us. Whoever doesn't belong to God doesn't listen to us. That's how we can tell the spirit of truth, which is influenced by the Holy Spirit, notice the capital S, from the spirit or the attitude of lies, which of course are influenced by the devil. Now, let's go back to John chapter 8, because we truly understand now why the Pharisees couldn't hear Jesus' words. They couldn't understand what he meant by them. Hallelujah. And we know why. They're not of God. Verse 8, here Jesus continues telling the Pharisees, verse 46, he says, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Remember what John said, those who belong to God listen to us. Therefore, the Pharisees were proving themselves not to be of God because they don't believe the truth coming from Jesus' mouth. Verse 46, he says, Which of you convince, convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Now here we go. Look at this very carefully in verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words which echoes pretty much what John said in his epistle in 1 John. Jesus says, Ye therefore, Pharisees, hear God's words not. Why? Because you are not of God. Hmm. So this indicates that these Pharisees received the free gift of regeneration but they chose to reject the truth and continue in the confusion of devil of the devil's lies. And Jesus said, this is the reason for the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men reject that light and they prefer darkness because their, e their deeds were evil. Perfect example of that right here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So, Getting back to the house on the sand for a moment, science has proven that modern day beach erosion is produced by the waves and the tides of the oceans causing sand on the beach to constantly shift and move. If you've ever been standing on the beach when the tide comes in, just take a look at it and you'll see how it moves with the flow of the water. Amen? 
sand like water has no defined form, but it conforms to whatever container it's put in. Hmm. Being a loose, granular material makes sand a poor foundation, and anything that's built upon it will also shift and eventually be dragged out to sea. So in building any kind of natural structure, using an unstable or fragile foundation for an underlying support will result in its eventual destruction. The same truth applies to spiritual structures as well. Now, getting back to Ephesians chapter 2, it's talking about a spiritual structure that is supported by a spiritual foundation, which can be, again, more accurately described as a system of truth. The original apostles and prophets established this system of truth with Christ himself as the cornerstone of this system of truth. Mm. Webster's Dictionary defines the word cornerstone as a stone forming a part of a corner or an angle in a wall. Okay, that's the natural description. But it also provides another definition of cornerstone which is a basic element, a foundation. Ah. Now, let's go deep and let's see what we can find. So put on your seatbelts, hang on to your hats. The prophecy of this specific cornerstone is first spoken of in Isaiah chapter 28. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 28, we're going to read verses 14 through 16. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 14. Isaiah said, Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Verse 19, I'm sorry, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion, which is also known as New Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And this is a figure of speech that means that they will not worry and they won't fear. Mm. So at that point, Israel as a whole worshiped the false Babylonian gods, and as a result, God allowed them to be defeated, and more than a few times, by their enemies. So regarding the idolatry and lying prophets that permeated and corrupted Israel, God then goes on to say in Zechariah chapter 10, let's turn there, Zechariah chapter 10, we're going to read verses 3 through 4, and this was written almost 200 years later during the Persian Empire. Verse 3, God said, Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds. And these were the leaders of Israel, the kings. And I punished the goats. In this context, he's talking about the Babylonians that attacked and enslaved Israel. Remember, this is now during the Persian Empire. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and has made the house of Judah as his goodly horse in the battle. Out of the house of Judah came forth the corner. And this is better translated as from Judah is the corner. 
out of or from him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. Ah. Now follow along with me. The Hebrew word for corner is the word pina, which is also seen in Psalm 118. Let's turn there. Psalm 118, and Psalm 118 was written about 300 years before Isaiah and 500 years up uh, uh, before Zechariah, okay? Psalm 118, we're going to read verses 22 and 23. Verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Ah, again, this was written about 500 years before Zechariah's ministry, which later told us that this headstone will come out of the tribe of Judah. We just read that. Verse 23, this is the Lord's, and when we see Lord in all caps, it means Yahweh, or if you prefer, Jehovah, which is also known as the Father. Okay, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Mm. But notice we see the same words repeating themselves, headstone and corner. Now, the headstone of the corner is actually two words in Hebrew. Headstone is the Hebrew word rosh, and it means the head, the top, the chief. Corner is the Hebrew word pina, which we read already. It means an angle, and by implication, it means a pinnacle, which is defined in Webster's Dictionary as the best or most important part of something. Mm. Hang in there with me. We're going somewhere with this. Together, Rosh Pina can be translated as the head or the chief of the most important part of something else. This would indicate that the headstone and the corner are two separate parts that become joined together as one structure. Now, if we recall Jesus' temptation in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, Satan took Jesus up and he set him on a pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, here is the perfect illustration of Christ being the rosh or the head of the penna or the pinnacle. Satan set Jesus in his rightful position as the future head of the temple in Jerusalem and dared Jesus to throw himself down from that position, knowing that Jesus could summon angels to help him. Now, this shows the subtlety of Satan's deception. Jesus was not the head of the unredeemed and corrupt earthly temple in Jerusalem. He is the head of the holy eternal temple of New Jerusalem, after all corruption is purged from the presence of God on earth. We see that in Revelation chapter 20. This was a temptation for Jesus to operate prematurely and assume an authority that he had not yet been given. And today we call that moving out of season. Ah, so the headstone and the corner are two separate parts joined together. Now, what are these two parts? What's lost in translation from Hebrew to English is a clue, and it's another reason why we absolutely must study with a concordance. Rosh, again, is the Hebrew for headstone 
is a masculine noun, while pena, Hebrew for the corner, is a feminine noun. Hmm. So here we have a male noun joined to a female noun with the male as the top or the head of the female. That should sound familiar. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. Mm. So therefore, Christ, being the head of every believing man and woman, makes mankind the body of Christ. Paul later tells us in verse 7, that the man is the image and glory of God, and that the woman is the glory of the man. That would make the rosh, masculine noun, the image and glory of God. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, tells us plainly that Christ is the image of God. Hmm. Therefore, Christ is the image of God and the head of his bride, the Pena, which Revelation chapter 21 tells us is New Jerusalem. Mm. I know that sounds radically different from what is commonly taught in Christendom today, but this is what the Word of God tells us. Don't believe me? Well, let's take it to the scriptures. Let's turn. Revelation chapter 1, uh, 21, I'm sorry. And we're going to pick it up from verse 2. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Christy. Welcome. Hallelujah, Sister Edith. Welcome. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. And this is after the white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. All evil, corruption, and sin has been purged from the presence of God, which is now on earth. Verse 21, verse, chapter 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, which he tells us is New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Heaven is actually the spiritual world prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Pay very close attention to that verse. Now let's skip down to verses 9 through 11. And there came unto John one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with John, saying, Come hither, or come here. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And what did this angel do? Verse 10, he carried John away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, which symbolizes a mighty government or kingdom, and showed John that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Hmm. Verse 11, having the glory of God and New Jerusalem's light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now let's stop here and let's go over this for a second. The angel took John to show him the lamb's wife and he showed him the city, New Jerusalem. So this tells us that New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, not the church. But if we slow down, we're going to see something absolutely profound. Notice in verse 2, New Jerusalem is called a bride. But in verse 9, she's called a bride and a wife. Did you catch that? This tells us that sometime between verse 2 and verse 8, the marriage 
of the bride to the bridegroom takes place. In verse 2, she's identified simply as a bride, but now she's a bride because it just occurred, but now she's, in, in, in addition to being a bride, she's now a wife. Ah, the concept is the same in our modern marriages. A woman is a bride up until the minute she says, I do. As soon as those words leave her mouth, and they're pronounced man and wife, even though she's still in her bridal gown, she's now a wife. Mm. Mm. Now, if we go back to Revelation chapter 19, two chapters before that, we're gonna see this. In Revelation chapter 19, verse nine, look at this, and, it's talking about the voice that was speaking to John in verse 6. That voice says unto John, write, blessed are they which are called, and this is the Greek word kaleo. It means called aloud or invited, hallelujah, unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto John, these are the true sayings of God. So in order to really understand this, let's understand Jewish marriage customs. Amen. Let's not think with our modern minds, but let's understand this verse as to how the Jew would have understood it. According to Jewish marriage customs, the friends of the bridegroom would be a part of the processional with the bride to the bridegroom's house. Remember in the parable of the foolish virgins, there was the processional and the announcement by the friend, prepare ye for the groom. That is talking about when he is coming out of his house, going to the bride's house, picking her up and bringing her back to his house where the marriage then takes place. Mm. It was in the bridegroom's house, again, the wedding took place, followed by the consummation of the marriage, we know what that is, and then the wedding feast. The church, which is also known as the body of Christ, is invited to the marriage supper and the greatest celebration of all time in all eternity, hallelujah, as the friends and guests of Christ. That Greek word kaleo means invited, and it's related to the root word klesis, which means called. Klesis is where we also get the Greek word ekklesia, the assembly of those called out, also known as the church. Mm. The church is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church is not the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. 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 God bless you, Sister Carla. Brother Charles, welcome. Now here, we're going to go on a little side note here. Going back to that Hebrew word for corner, which is penah, it comes from the same root word of another name that we may be familiar with. That name is the name Penina. And Penina was one of the two wives of Elkanah. The other wife was Hannah, who was the mother of the prophet Samuel. Now the name Penina means a jewel. And it comes from the same root word, meaning a corner, pinna. What's fascinating, again, we have to study the word of God with a concordance. Hallelujah. What's fascinating is that the name Elkanah means God has created. The name Hannah means grace. And the name Samuel means his name is El, and El means God. 
So, if we put them all together according to the definitions of the names in that family, Elkanah, God has created, Hannah, by grace, Samuel, a man whose name is God. God has created by grace a man whose name is God. This is a hidden prophecy revealed through this marriage covenant of grace that was prophesied by Isaiah. And it's a very familiar verse. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government which is the kingdom of God, shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called, hallelujah, remember Elkanah's name. God has created. His name shall be called, and look at these different names. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's Samuel's name right there. His name is El, or his name is God. What did Isaiah say? His name shall be called, one of the names, the mighty God. Hallelujah. So this is evidence that the marriage covenant of Elkanah and Hannah prophesied the future birth of the Messiah who would come in the form of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The promised child, Jesus, was rejected by the builders of the temple, who were Israel, and he became the head of the temple of God. Hallelujah. Which, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, is the church. Paul said, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Hallelujah. Psalm 118, which we read earlier, identifies Christ as the Rosh or the headstone and New Jerusalem as the Pinah, a type of which is seen in Christ's temptation in Matthew chapter 4. The head and the Pinah, Christ being placed on the pinnacle of the church. Mm. Therefore, Christ is the rejected head, top chief, who will be joined to New Jerusalem, whom Revelation chapter 21, which we just read, identifies as the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So in putting all of this together, we come to this conclusion. Christ is the chief and primary element in a system of truth that supports his assembly of believers. The church, also known as the ecclesia, that are called out of the kingdom of Satan, which is also known as the world, and added to the kingdom of heaven, which is also known as the church. Expressed differently, this same revelation of Christ is given in Matthew chapter 16 through Peter. Hallelujah. Let's turn there. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read verses 13 through 19. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Jorge. Welcome. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read uh, 13 through 19. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the disciples said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, which is uh, the Greek form of Elijah the prophet, and others, Jeremiah, which is Greek for Jeremiah the prophet, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, Jesus saith unto his disciples, 
but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is a revelation of the first principle of who Christ is that everyone must receive from the Holy Spirit in order to be added to God's church. You see, you can't join God's church. We must be added to it by virtue of our belief in the gospel and the revelation from the Holy Spirit of who Christ is. Mm. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Peter, blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. Now, what's interesting is that he refers to Peter by his given name, Simon bar Jonah. And if we break down the name, Simon means one who hears. Bar Jonah is two words, bar meaning son and Jonah which is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Jonah, the one that got swallowed by the whale. Jonah means dove, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Put it all together. One who hears the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what Simon bar Jonah means. Hmm. And obviously, Peter heard the Holy Spirit and Jesus tells us why. Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, and he tells us why. For or because flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee. In other words, no human person told you this. But my Father, which is in heaven, hallelujah, he's saying that the Father revealed it to Peter through the Holy Spirit. Simon bar Jonah. He who hears the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, it's imperative that all ministries and churches of Christ be established upon this truth and that each believer receives this revelation from the Holy Spirit for themselves. Hallelujah. It's not enough for somebody to tell us or to preach it to us. The Holy Spirit must reveal this truth to us, each of us individually. Hallelujah. Continuing, verse 18. And Jesus said, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, which is the Greek word Petra, and in this context, it's talking about a large stone. I will build my church. Build is the Greek word oikodomeo. Oikodomeo. And it means to build, to erect. It also means to restore by rebuilding or repairing. Mm. This tells us that if the body of Christ is being rebuilt or restored at some point in the past, man was previously Christ's body, and Lucifer's influence, to put it mildly, destroyed that communion with God. Mm. This obviously alludes to Adam. As revealed in Genesis chapter 2, Adam was to function as the original high priest of mankind. That is locked in the words, till the ground, which is a euphemism meaning to serve with Levitical service as a priest. Hmm. This is the reason why God formed this specific man, Adam, to be the original high priest of mankind, and the liaison between God and man. However, due to Lucifer's corrupting influence, Adam fell into sin. Christ is now rebuilding and restoring what existed previously in Adam. 
Remember, the Holy Spirit was breathed into Adam, causing Adam to become a living soul. This doesn't mean that he was, he was animated to life. He was a soul that was alive, meaning that he was now in communion with God and can communicate with God. Hmm. We're talking about intimate fellowship between God and man by a righteousness that is now made possible through belief of the gospel. The gospel, as we covered a few teachings ago, is the invitation to the wedding of New Jerusalem to Christ in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. You see how the pieces fit together once we learn what the scriptures are actually saying? You know, throwing away presuppositions and throwing away traditions of things that people have been teaching forever, but never really dug deep to find out what it means? Mm. Now, while all of this might sound a bit strange and a bit different from what we're accustomed to hearing, it's important to be able to take a step back and see the big picture. Adam was filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing Adam to communicate with God and function as God's liaison to the rest of mankind. Satan, Lucifer, in his role as the devil, manipulated Adam into indulging in and focusing on his own desires, whether they were forbidden or premature. We know that was to eat of the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was forbidden to them. And this caused Adam to sin. Of course, he used Eve to get to God, uh, to get to Adam, I'm sorry. And this triggered the spiritual death penalty for man, dooming mankind to eternal separation from God, which is also known as spiritual death. At this point, mankind, and still does in general, now exists in a realm of darkness and confusion under Satan. And as part of his eternal plan, which was conceived before mankind was even created, the Father then sent himself in human form as Jesus Christ to deliver a message to mankind. And that message was, judgment is coming upon Lucifer and all that follow him. The kingdom of Satan will be destroyed and replaced by the kingdom of God. And everyone that is currently being dominated by sin is being invited to be a part of the kingdom of God, which includes being invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The slate will be wiped clean. All sin will be forgiven. All we have to do is believe the message. Very simple. And those who believe the gospel are then translated out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of heaven and are prepared for the coming kingdom of God. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let's finish the balance of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Hallelujah. He says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, or it shall not overcome what? Christ's church. Now, natural thinking tells us that gates are physical barriers that govern entrance and exit from a place. However, to the Jewish mindset, the gate of a city is the chief place where courts of justice were held and public business was transacted. According to Adam Clark's commentary, he says that the gate of the king, which is a position that was filled by people such as Daniel, and Mordecai, the gate of the king was a position of the chief officer in the palace and the greatest confidant and counselor 
of the king. So by this, we can perceive that the gates of hell refer to the officers and counselors of hell and the spiritual place where plans are conceived against individuals and the kingdom of heaven. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take the kingdom of heaven by force. It's not talking about the church going into the enemy's camp and taking back what he stole from you. No, because a nature of violence is contrary to the nature of Christ. It can't be referring to the church. It's talking about people who try to subdue the kingdom of heaven and prevent it from becoming the kingdom of God. Mm. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to read verses 54 through 56. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless your sister Rosie, brother Thomas. Welcome. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 56. Paul says, So when this corruptible, he's talking about his body, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, that is written, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? In other words, your deadly weapon has no effect on me. I've been afraid of this all my life, and right now it's a bit anticlimactic. <laughs> Where's your sting? O oh, grave which is the torment and separation from God, which is also known as hell, where is thy victory? The sting or the deadly weapon of death is sin. Hmm. That's because sin causes death. And the strength of sin is the law. So breaking the commandment of God, which is a law, doesn't necessarily mean the Ten Commandments or the Mosaic Law. It's breaking any commandment of God is sin. And it gives death the necessary authority to be enforced as the penalty. So Satan tempts man to disobey God, which, if successful, then leads to death. And the unrepentant sinner is incarcerated in hell until judgment. Now. Let's look at Revelation chapter 6. You see, Paul personifies death and hell, also known as the grave. Look at this in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. And John looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with death. And power was given unto death and hell over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Hmm. So death signifies physical death, while hell signifies spiritual death, because hell is the place for the wicked dead, not the righteous dead. Hmm. The wicked dead are on their way to spiritual death, which the book of Revelation calls the second death, and it's the separation, eternal separation, from the presence of God in the lake of fire. Hmm. And as seen in James, James chapter 1, Satan uses our own unauthorized or premature desires to lure us into his trap. Now let's backtrack just for a second. I'm sure somebody's out there thinking, well, wait a second, wait a second. How are you getting the lake of fire to mean eternal separation from God? Well, if you read that part, Revelation chapter 20, you'll see that it's the lake of fire that is burning with brimstone. Brimstone is the archaic name for sulfur. Okay? 
Sulfur, as we know, it stinks like rotten eggs, but it was also used as a disinfectant for wounds on the battlefield during war. If anybody has ever seen Saving Private Ryan, there was a scene where the, the medic that went with them was played by Giovanni Ribisi, where he got shot, I believe it was in the back, and it was blood pumping out of him, and it was dark colored blood, so he knew it was coming from his liver, which means he wasn't going to make it. Well, his fellow soldiers that were with him in the middle of a field pulled out of his backpack, because he was the medic, pulled out this big packet and ripped it open, and it was full of sulfur. And they sprinkled it on the wound, and it's supposed to disinfect the wound so you could stabilize that wounded soldier until you can get him to proper medical uh, help and get some proper medical attention. So sulfur is used as a disinfectant. This lake of fire is burning with disinfectant. Think spiritually now. What is being disinfected? The, the earth. From what? The presence of evil and corruption. It's being purged from the earth so that all that remains is righteousness. This is how we can tell that the lake of fire is the eternal separation from the presence of God because the wicked dead are being disinfected. The earth is being disinfected and the wicked dead are being purged and eternally separated from this earth, resulting in righteousness. That's all that will be left. Amen? Hallelujah. Again, Satan uses our own unauthorized or premature desires to lure us into his trap. And once we're distracted by what we want, Satan then uses flattery and charm to influence us to pursue that illegal desire, which results in sin. And once sin is committed, death is given enforceable authority according to the law of God. Hallelujah. And we also know Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. The revelation that we can see in all of this is that Satan uses the law of God against man by tempting man to sin, which then triggers the death penalty for sin. The consequences can be seen to be like a beast in that death then consumes the wicked, depositing them in hell, which then swallows them up. So therefore, we can conclude that the gates of hell are the corrupt principalities and powers that we struggle against. If you remember our teachings, amen, from the parables of Christ, amen, the gates of hell are the corrupt principalities and powers, different classes of spiritual beings, rebellious spiritual beings that are fighting against us. And their king, who is the highest ranking spiritual rebel, is none other than Lucifer himself. And Lucifer is a cherub, the third highest ranking spiritual beings right behind the Ophanim, which are the wheels in God's throne seen in Ezekiel. The wheel in the middle of a wheel, those are the Ophanim, and the highest being the seraphim. They're like fire, and they're the ones that shout all day and sing all day, holy, 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 holy. Amen? Hallelujah. 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 God bless you, Sister Janice. Brother Reuben, welcome. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 16, Jesus continues talking to Peter, verse 19, and he says, and I will give unto thee. Now, as I, I may have taught this once before, when we see the words thee and thou and thine, 
And is the other words ye, you, and your? If it begins with a T, the, thou, thine, it's singular. If it begins with a Y, ye, you, or your, it's plural. So here we see Jesus saying to Peter, I will give unto thee, and he's talking directly to Peter, not to all of the disciples, but to Peter. Why? Because Peter is the one who uttered the revelation from the Holy Spirit that Jesus was the Christ and the Son of the living God. So he's talking directly to Peter, and he says, I will give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Notice the colon. The colon here indicates the purpose of these keys. And he continues and says, And whatever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now these words don't mean to bind a demon. I absolutely cringe when I hear people saying, I, I bind you, Satan. I bind you, demon, relying on this particular verse. That's not what it means. Bind means to obligate. So whatever you obligate on earth will be obligated in heaven. Or whatever obligation you put on a person on earth will be obligated also in heaven. It will be recognized and validated in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose or release, here on earth shall also be released in heaven. So whatever actions are taken will be acknowledged in the spiritual world. He's talking directly to Peter. Remember this now. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So this is what this binding and loosing is in reference to, the kingdom of heaven. Keys have two functions. We all know this either to lock or to unlock. Lock, meaning bind, or unlock, meaning loose. Now, because these are keys to the kingdom of heaven, the context tells us that the keys can either allow or deny access to the kingdom of heaven. John chapter 14 tells us that those who believe the gospel of Christ are called out of the world, also known as the kingdom of Satan, and, as the writer of Hebrews puts it, are translated into the ecclesia, which is the kingdom of heaven. Without experiencing regeneration, which is a manifestation of the grace of God, no one, let me say that again. No one in the physical world can perceive the existence and the distinction of these two separate kingdoms, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of heaven. And this is just as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So therefore, the gospel of Christ is the key that unlocks and enables access to the kingdom of of heaven. Mm. Which is why it is absolutely important and imperative for us to know what the gospel is. It's not Christ crucified. It is the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. You can't use the key if you don't know how to use the key or what that key is for. Mm. But notice this. Jesus said, keys, plural. Peter was given two keys, one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. And this was because there were two different areas that were an impediment to the Jews and Gentiles in receiving Christ. Let's take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 24. Let's turn there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 20, Paul says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? 
Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Hallelujah. And it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were considered learned in the scriptures. And they were ignorant of the truth that was found in the very scriptures that they were supposed to be experts in. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, which is corrupt human society, by natural wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And here's the reason why. Verse 22, for or because the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, talking about the person that you had crucified, that you manipulated the Romans into crucifying, he was the Messiah that the scriptures preach of that we've been waiting for all this time. Hmm, that is not the gospel, but they were identifying Christ as being the Messiah. Remember who he's talking to. He says, but we preach Christ crucified, which is unto the Jews a stumbling block. In other words, it offends them. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. In other words, it made no sense to the Greeks because the Greeks were not Jewish and they were ignorant of the spiritual debt cancellation that was made by Christ on the cross, which enabled the non-Jewish person to now approach God through belief of the gospel. They were ignorant of that. Say, what are you talking about? I don't know nothing about this. Verse 24, but unto them which are called or invited in the kingdom, into the kingdom of God, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God, which satisfies the, the Jews' need for a sign, and the wisdom of God, which satisfies the Greeks' need for wisdom. Hmm, they were heavy into philosophy. So in order for the apostles to share the gospel with the world, the Jews and the Gentiles would each require a different approach in order for them to believe in Christ and receive the promise of salvation. To the Jews, Christ was the prophesied Messiah. To the Gentiles or the non-Jews, not just Greeks, but everybody who's not a Jew, Christ was the reconciler and all-knowing God. This explains why Paul, who was one of the greatest teachers in the Bible, hallelujah, it explains why Paul was generally ineffective in sharing the gospel with Jews. He was sent as the apostle to the Gentiles. That's the key he was given. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see that it was Paul's habit whenever he went into a new city to first go into the synagogue, the temple of the Jews, or that local temple of the Jews, and preach Christ there. In most cases, he was ridiculed and ran out of there, but there was always a handful of people that believed Paul, just a handful. And from there, he then went and preach Christ to the Gentiles. Hmm. That's one key that Paul was given. But however, Peter was given the ability and the authority to preach the gospel effectively to both Jew and non-Jew. And this brings us to an amazing revelation. If it's the belief of the gospel that unlocks and enables access to the kingdom of heaven, it is therefore unbelief that locks and rejects access to the kingdom of heaven. I guess it would be like putting in the wrong pin, locks you out, and now you're unable to access what you were trying to access. Hmm. Peter used these two keys in that situation 
with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. We're not going to go into that, but you take a look at that scripture. I know it's a very familiar scripture, but take a look at it and read it slowly. Hmm. So now to sum all of this up, Christ's church is the spiritual structure consisting of people that have been called out of the kingdom of Satan, also known as the world, into the kingdom of heaven through the gospel. However, not all who are called out of the kingdom of Satan actually come out. John chapter 3 tells us that although spiritual illumination of the mind came into human society through Jesus Christ, those who love sin, confusion, corruption, and darkness reject that spiritual illumination of the gospel and thus remain in the kingdom of Satan, destined for hell and the second death, which is the eternal separation from the presence of God through the lake of fire. Now, the original apostles and prophets both had, or, or I should say, who both had and taught this revelation of who Christ is became the foundation of the assembly that Jesus is currently restoring through them. That's right. The ecclesia is not finished being built. Because if it was, that means the very last person that God in his foreknowledge knows will believe the gospel, the very last person will have already been added to the church and now there's nothing left for Christ to wait for. Because he has not yet returned, that's proof that the church is not finished being built. There are plenty of unbelievers walking around out there that are destined to become believers. They don't know it. We don't know who they are. But God does. Hmm. That's the job of the church as the body of Christ, to reach out and make the introduction leading them to Christ by sharing the gospel. Amen? Hallelujah. The original apostles' teaching is what the scriptures call the apostles' doctrine. It's nothing new that they made up themselves, amen? And you can read about that in Acts chapter 2, verse 24. So modern-day apostles and prophets must also have and teach this revelation of who Christ is, plain and simple. The requirement of believing the gospel and being submitted to Christ applies to everyone, and that included all of Jesus' disciples. Just to be sure, it doesn't mean that we are to force anyone to believe the gospel. A mind changed against its will remains of the same opinion still, no matter what comes out of their mouth. So it is not our job to force anybody to believe the gospel. It is just simply our job to preach the truth and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. And if that person chooses to believe the gospel, hallelujah. And if that person chooses not to believe the gospel, all we can do is keep trying by telling them and saying the same thing to them, sharing the gospel. But we can't shout, shame, or shove Jesus down anybody's throat because it won't work. They'll simply regurgitate it back up and walk on out about their business, and then they'll avoid us, and we'll never have a second chance to share the gospel. Mm. There is no other foundation or system of truth that is strong enough to build Christ's body on. And any other system of belief that masquerades as the truth is nothing more than shifting sand, and everything that is built on it will fall and crumble. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With the coming Antichrist, there will be a system of 
false truth that will be masquerading as the real truth. Yeah? A cult-like personality, a system of cult worship of this one person who will tell unbelievers everything that they want to hear. Hmm. That is why it is so imperative for us to know what the gospel is and to preach what the gospel is. Hallelujah. And for us to receive that revelation that Christ is the son of the living God and share it. Amen? We can't force anybody to believe anything. And if we think that it's our job to try and do that, that means we're taking more authority upon ourselves than God gave us. Hmm? That we're trying to do something that we think God can't do. Is there anything too hard for God? No, there isn't. So we must have enough faith in God to do our part, stay in our lane, and let the Holy Spirit do his work in God's timing. Amen? Hallelujah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hallelujah. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. We love you and your word, your ideas, your thoughts, and your concepts. This plan, Father, that you have conceived before you even created us, and you are working that plan step by step, and we already know, because your word has told us, that it will be successful. It will work out exactly the way that you have foreseen, or foreseen that it will. Hallelujah. Who is like you? Who is as wise as you, Father? Who can come up with these plans that work to a T as well as you can? Nobody. Hallelujah. And Father, we thank you for loving us so much that you want to include us in this magnificent, fabulous kingdom and a new realm of existence that is coming. We believe it and we receive it, eagerly awaiting it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And let the church say amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this concludes our Bible study for this evening. It's almost at 10 o'clock, but we will take time. Hallelujah. For any questions, any comments anybody would like to share and add, amen, please write it down in the comment section. We will share them all. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you called in a little bit late, you might have missed it. But hallelujah, this is my new or one of my latest books that I've just finished on the Acts of the Apostles. This is actually book one. Amen. Uh, book two and book one are now available uh, as a print book or an ebook if you're interested in studying the book of. Acts of the Apostles, amen. It's fully annotated, commentaries, the whole bit as we journey through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, line by line, verse by verse. It's available as a print book or ebook from lulu.com and from Amazon. The link is already there in the comments section. So if you are interested and would love to support my ministry, I want to thank you in advance. It's available. Amen. And I pray that it does bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, for those of you, amen. Hallelujah. Brother Reuben says, hallelujah. Glory to the Father. Amen. Glory to his name. Now, if anybody might have joined with us late or missed any part of it, you know it's recorded. You can watch this five, not even two minutes after we log off from Facebook. However, it's recorded. And you can watch this in its entirety, uh, either here on Facebook. You can also uh, see it at our website, which is www.transformingwordnyc.org. 
It'll be uploaded there as, rest, as well as the rest of the teachings from our current series on church cliches and our previous series on the parables of Christ. Hallelujah. And this teaching will also be uploaded to our YouTube page. Just put in a search for Transforming Word Ministries. It will be there as well as the previous teachings from this series and our previous series. Amen. All I ask that you do is share the link for this video, share the link for our website and for our YouTube page with as many believers and even non-believers. Amen. Let's not limit it. All of you, because as, as we know, there are unbelievers who are destined to be believers and they just don't know it yet. So let's not exclude anybody. Hallelujah. And allow the Holy Spirit to work. It's not about building transforming word ministries, but it's about edifying the body of Christ in the time that we have left before Christ returns. Amen. I'm only one person. I can only do but so much. And I've been in Facebook jail many, many, many times for sharing too often. Amen. So if anybody could assist me in getting this word out to those who who are hungry for the word of God. Maybe they, their schedule prevents them from going to Bible study, or maybe um, they don't have a church home, the church is too far away, they're housebound. Maybe they don't have Bible study at their church. Amen. The whole purpose is that nobody gets left behind. Nobody falls through the cracks. Amen. So if you could join with me in sharing these links, we can accomplish so much more together than just one person, little old me, can do by myself. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, if there aren't any questions or any other comments, amen, that's just fine. I know it's a little bit late. People have to get up and go to work or to school tomorrow. By God's grace, next week, June 11th, which happens to be my birthday, amen, and just because it's my birthday doesn't mean that the work ceases. Hallelujah. Next week, June 11th, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we will be back as we continue our series on church cliches, straightening out what has gone crooked, amen, and setting order according to the Word of God. Amen. Please try and join with us next week. Invite a friend. Amen. If you want to share this video as a watch party on your time uh, timeline um, or in your news feed, please feel free. Go right ahead and do so. Amen. Hallelujah. Invite a friend to join with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, again, I want to thank all of you that have joined with us this evening, even if it was just for a few minutes. Amen. I pray that somehow God has used me to be a blessing to you. And by God's grace, again, we will be back next Tuesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, as we continue our journey through the Word of God. Amen. So thank you for joining us here tonight, Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm Apostle Marcos. And until we meet next time, remember, please, to constantly be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is a process. Amen. And in doing so, we will all be able to know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God in your life and in mine. God bless you. Have a blessed evening, a blessed week. We'll see you next time in Jesus' name. Night, everybody. <laughs>